Pools editor for the uh, for swimming and diving, and so someone that uh, I've worked with for a number of years that Mike Slagle and Diane Hicks Hughes have worked with, and uh, that's been a pleasurable experience for all of us. And and um, concussions are not. Becky is not a doctor, and <laughs> she's filling in for uh, someone else who's originally scheduled to do this. But Becky will do a great job. Uh, talking to us about concussions in sports and particularly in swimming. So I give you Becky Oaks. Well, thank you very much. Um, first off, is that too loud? Okay. Is it loud enough? Okay. Um, I want to thank you very much for the invitation for the National Federation to take part in the NISCA conference. Um, I will tell you that uh, I, this is my seventh year with the National Federation office and as the uh, sports liaison rules editor for the sport of swimming and diving. And since I've started, we've had uh, a guest always at our meeting from NISCA to give us input from the organization, from high school coaches about the potential rules that are coming up. This year we're a little bit reverse, but Paul still did a great job of getting input from you all and, and providing that to our rules committee. I will tell you that that is an invaluable piece uh, of the rules making process for us. So I want to thank NISCA for um, your cooperation and your support in providing those individuals over the years who have come to our meetings uh, to provide that input. Um, we're one of the few, we're one of the few rules committees that actually has the, nas the national coaching body for that sport actually on a regular basis have a representative from that group at the rules table. Uh, so I can tell you that it's, it's very, very important and um, you all have helped us from making some mistakes every once in a while because of your input of what you've done and um, we, we appreciate that not only with swimming but with diving as well. We get a lot of input from diving coming into the rules committee and as you all know we don't always have a room full of experts in diving. We have, so that, that is very valuable for us. Uh, I do want to, um, right up front, do my disclaimer. I am not the staff member that normally works with concussion. That is Bob Colgate. And if Bob Colgate were here, you could ask him anything about concussions. And I'm telling you, he could not only answer it, but he could give you every statistic that probably exists regarding concussions. So I, uh, Bob, is, Bob has prepared all this material. and. We're familiar with it as rules editors because we work with that with, with all of our sports, but uh, some of the other areas that we work with, uh, that, that, is, that is Bob's uh, kind of specialty. Before I begin today, uh, reason for the switching of the order, who wants to start your day off talking about sexual abuse? Uh, you know, uh, we'll have some things ready this afternoon and I, th I, I think you will, it will be a beneficial session for you to take part in. I will tell you that it will be uh, a session where we're going to share some ideas as well. So I hope you come back for that, that session. Um, I know that, that is, that's a big topic in every sport. It is a big topic in the sport of swimming. Uh, so we'll, we'll cover that later on this afternoon. Uh, I also want to uh, announce, and I, and I think you've already talked about this maybe at some of your meetings, but uh, NISCA is our partner uh, in working with a new online co uh, coaching course. It's called Fundamentals of Coaching Swimming. Uh, it's just now kind of in the development stages. Uh, Arvel has worked to uh, start us with the script and he said today was, wow, that was a whole heck of a lot harder than what I thought it was going to be. There's a lot to know about swimming. Imagine that. Uh, but we're very excited to have that, uh, that course in development and appreciate again that NISCA is our, our partner. We're going to what we believe are the, the experts in coaching high school swimming. And um, so that's a, that's a project that will be ongoing and I have a feeling that there probably will be more than one or two of you that might get tapped on the shoulder to say, hey, take a look at this and see, see if we're doing it the right way, have, have what works with everything for, uh, for our coaches. So we're very exciting to have that course. Now you will notice that I said swimming I didn't say diving. Uh, after we reviewed everything, it was our, our opinion and, and also uh, with getting input from NISCA that 
There was so much to cover in swimming. Diving is a specialty uh, sport in and of itself. So we will uh, have a follow-up course that will deal with diving and um, we will come back and, and work on, on that. So I didn't want anybody to think that we're not paying attention to diving. We are, but after we reviewed that, we, we determined that there's so much more that needs to go in with the diving that we didn't want to just kind of brush over it. So we will, we will address that, that that will be, you know, that will be forthcoming as a, as a follow-up to the swimming course. So uh, that's, that's to be there. And again, we appreciate all the help and the, and the help to come uh, with, uh, with that course. All right, um, I also want to, I think we've got a couple of swimming rules committee folks here in the room. Uh, we have Mike Slagle, uh, who is on our, our swimming committee. And Mike is, is just ending his term. He still has lots of work left to do, but he is just ending his term on the committee. And uh, we have our, the chair of our rules committee, uh, Diane Hicks-Hughes, uh, sitting up here in the front. Most of you, I'm assuming, probably know Diane. And uh, Diane wears two hats for us. She is the chair of our committee, but she is also the official representative for the Federation on USA Swimming's uh, Rules Committee. And they meet twice a year, I believe. And, and uh, Diane represents us as a voting member on that, that Rules Committee. So we appreciate um, uh, everyone's help that's on the committee, but appreciate Diane wearing kind of the, the double hat uh, with that as our, our uh, representative. Okay, let's get started about concussions. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background um, about what goes on with sports medicine in your state or in the country, how we're having to deal with concussions. It helps you to get a little bit of a background. Uh, this is just to give you an idea of the number of states that have a what we call a sports medicine advisory committee. Uh, so some a committee that works with your uh, high school state association uh, to deal with issues of sports medicine. And this will probably be the, what I would say, the driving committee uh, in your state for various policies that you're going to deal with, whether it's concussion or communicable disease, um, whatever the, the case may be that deals with sports medicine. So you can see that uh, 48 states currently have such a committee in place. There's our building. I just want to let you know that if you, as you're walking down toward uh, the, the natatorium, if you walk toward the NCAA building, we are the building, the older building right there. Um, that's our office. We, we office right next door to the NCAA. Uh, a lot of folks want to know where we are. It's pretty lucky when you move to Indianapolis and you sit and you look at the canal and you look at green grass. That was kind of hard to imagine that that was going to happen moving to a city. Uh, the Federation, just to give you a little bit of background about the NFHS, uh, we are an organization that we write rules for uh, 17 different sports for girls and boys. We do serve as the national authority on, on high school sports. Uh, we have various national meetings that we conduct. We sanction events. So when you have various swimming meets that you're going interstate competition, uh, that would go a sanctioning process through your state and through our office. And we produce a lot of publications for high school coaches um, and then serve as a, a resource. And the coaches education would just be an example of that. Whoops. Well, let me get the right button here. I apologize. Uh, this is how we're broken out within the United States. We have eight sections. Uh, we have 51, we call it 51 state associations. When I say that, everybody looks like 51. District of Columbia is a, quote, a state association is a member. So we have 51 members. You can see about 19,000 um, high schools that are, are going to be represented through your various state associations. On our rules committee, we have one representative from each of these eight sections. Okay, so that's kind of the process when we get into the rules writing. Uh, and then basically our, our mission statement, I'm not going to read that to you. you, you can handle that. But basically is we're looking at um, consistency and rules that are appropriate for education-based high school age uh, athletes uh, with an emphasis on sportsmanship, citizenship, 
uh, and safety when we, when we uh, look at our, our rules. Um, now we want to kind of get into the concussion aspect. The states in the uh, purple are the states that have con their state legislature. You have a state law in those states that deal with concussion. And I'm sure that most of you in here, uh, you've had some type of program in your school that they've talked about this, of, but it is, a, it is a state law. Some states have, what I would say, done this on their own, and they have not maybe developed legislation in conjunction with working with their high school associations, and that's a minimal number, and then most have worked with their high school associations to develop the legislation. And the advantage to that, as you could probably imagine, is there is a, what I would say, there is a practical side to the development of that legislation. So as a coach, either you as an individual or you as a coach within your school district need to make sure that you are aware of whatever your state legislation is because it is law. Okay, it is law. Uh, this is just an example of the number of uh, sports that we work with, and in each of those sports there is information uh, and rules dealing with the handling of concussion and we, what we call recognition of concussion and return to play policies. Uh, here's what we have uh, in all of our rule books, and there, there really is a, a change here, and as coaches you need to be aware of what this change meant means to you as a coach. We talk about an athlete who exhibits signs. We're not saying that they have a concussion or an apparent concussion. We're just saying that they exhibit signs. Now you need to kind of know what the signs and symptoms are of a concussion because you could have, for example, an athlete that is a diabetic that is having issues uh, with a diabetic situation that might have some of the same signs or symptoms of, a, of what you might see with a concussion if someone's kind of a little disoriented. So you want to make sure that you know what the signs and symptoms are. Your officials are to be aware of those same signs and symptoms, but your official's duty is to merely, what I would say, stop play, stop the athlete from participating and refer to the coach. So what I call it is the official is stopping and opening the door for the coach to take care of his or her athlete. Now in the past, the official had much more responsibility to look at the athlete and you know stop and say, I think your athlete may have a concussion. That's been removed from the official because they don't know these kids. They, they have no idea what they're like. They have no idea what other conditions they may have. But you as the coach does. So there's a a sharp shift of responsibility that it's over to the coach. Okay, that's important to know. A big shift of responsibility over to the coach. So as a coach, uh, you're going to do two things. You're going to have your state high school association is going to provide you with information, which is probably going to be incorporated into your school district policies. Uh, and then the coach will have some responsibilities. So as a state association, what they're going to do for you is they will be aware of current laws. Uh, they will define, they will define who an appropriate health care pro professional or provider is. All right? And that's important because only that appropriate health care person is the one that, that has the authority uh, to say this athlete is ready to return to play. Okay? Um, each state will define what's the criteria for return to play. And that's different from state to state. Um, we also have to know what, what's the, me uh, the mechanics for removal and reentry. Okay, and when I say removal and reentry, some states may say that it takes a written authorization. Some states may say that it, it only goes between the uh, physician and a note to the, the coach, or they may say no. We want it to go to the, the referee. It uh, just depends on the state. So that's, that's your state association that will uh, develop that process. And then, of course, educate the schools uh, and then also educate officials uh, and parents and athletes. 
Okay, athletes. Athletes have a responsibility in this. How many of you have ever had an athlete that you think might be a little bit stubborn and not tell you that they got hit or hit the end on a turn, you know, hit the pool on a turn, or, and they say, ah, I'm okay. Anybody have anybody like that? Yeah, okay. All those folks are, you know, they're problematic a little bit. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm just telling you, you know, I think back, e even now, if I think I might have gotten hurt a little bit, I can always tell you, I feel okay, I can go do this or do that. But what we're finding with research is more and more, and it's almost like a daily uh, situation, that the issue of concussions and the side effects that the athlete or the student or the individual can have, they're so much more serious than what we ever anticipated. Uh, and youth, high school, younger, they are more susceptible to those injuries than adults are. So we're, we're in the group that, well, I would say, we're working with a group that has no fear. We're working with a group that wants to take risk. And we're working with a group that is also very susceptible to the um, long-term injuries that could come from a concussion. Uh, we talked about the appropriate healthcare professionals. Um, you, you do need to know who they are. And they have a shared responsibility with you as a coach as to whether or not your athlete comes out, um, when they're ready to return to play. And of course, they need to keep up on the issue of concussion. Um, you know, I will tell you that a concussion that is suffered from a sports injury may be different or may occur in different ways than if I say, well, I was in a car wreck or I fell off the ladder at my house. They're all concussions, but there are so many more ways that a concussion can occur uh, in a sports setting. You don't always have to get hit on the head in order to have a concussion. You could get a severe jarring and still have uh, a concussion. So your healthcare professionals need to keep up on uh, what's going on with um, concussions. Your state will decide who they are. Here's just a few examples of um, who in your state might be certified to deal with a return to play, uh, who your Board of Healing Arts will say these individuals are qualified to indicate whether somebody can come back to play or not, not come back to play. All right, so make sure that as a coach, you know who those individuals are. Make sure your school district knows who those individuals are. And if you're in a school that maybe hasn't spelled this out for you, um, it would be good for you as a coach, as they say, kind of covering your own tail a little bit, that there, there definitely is a definition there from your school district. Um, coaches, you have the responsibility again, to stay educated. That means that reading one article on a concussion isn't going to do it because that's going to change as we find out more and more. So just as you stay up on you know, new training techniques, you need to stay up on new research that happens with uh, concussions. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Make sure your school district has shared with you and reviewed with you their return to play policy. Some state laws require that. Some state high school associations have that in there. And then you know how it is when it gets down to the local level from school to school, that may differ. You want to know as a coach, what is your return to play policy? You want to know first and foremost for the safety of the athlete. And you want to know for you as the coach because you're the one that's kind of left holding the bag if you put that, that swimmer or that diver back into competition or practice too soon. Uh, we talked a little bit about the officials and their recognition of, of what they do. Uh, again, they're opening the door. Once, once that athlete has been removed from the competition, uh, then at that point it turns over to the health care and it turns over to, um, you know, turns over to the, the coach. So any of you let me ask this. How many of you, when you have practice, have a certified athletic trainer right there with you? Anybody? Okay. Okay. It, okay. It, how about in the building? When you're practicing? Got one in the building? So about half. Uh, how about at your meets? Do you have, at your home meets, do you have a, a trainer there on deck? 
when you're when you hosting a meet? In the building. How about when you go on the road? In their building. Okay. So how how, how have any of you ever gone anywhere and there is no healthcare professional with you? Yeah. Okay. So that what that does is that kind of shifts over to you or as we all do, is there a doctor in the house? Uh, all right. So you want to make sure that you as the, the, you know what the official does, but you as the coach, again, sometimes you have to assume at least the, what I would say, the pulling out of play, but it is not the official's decision. Okay? It is not the official's decision. It, it, is, it is your decision. Uh, how we're trying to help schools with injuries in general, and I'm going to go a little bit broader than, than concussions for just a minute. We have a uh, national uh, injury surveillance system, and we are in our, in our sixth year right now. Swimming and diving has been one of the sports that we started with at the very beginning, and this is um, a, a surveillance system that is done by Dr. Don Comstock, and it is, we refer to it as, as a snapshot, so I'll kind of just briefly kind of tell you how this works. This is a, um, this injury reporting system is a st statistically reliable and valid study. It is a sampling of the athletes in the sports across the United States. So this is not something that when you look at this and you say, well, there were only, you know, eight injuries in the United States all year. That, that's not what this is doing. It's from the reporting schools. We have a large enough sample that it is reliable from a statistical standpoint that basically when you look at this you can say we can extrapolate out that as we go as we view the full um, uh, numbers of participation that these same percentage was, would hold out uh, through the sport okay so when you look at this we're not telling you that these were the only injuries in this area that occurred we're telling you that if you look at this this is going to tell you this is this is your percentage that across the United States, this is what we would see in the sport of swimming and diving. Um, if you look at the injury data in boys and girls swimming and diving, we had the lowest injury rate of the 20 sports that um, we, we uh, include in the surveillance system. Now that's pretty good, folks, because we, we, we have a lot of kids and, you know, you hear all these, what I would say, kind of these stories of, what event do we have in our program in swimming and diving? What event do we have that scares everybody? Diving, right? And, and if you listen to people talk, you would think that it's this big bad event that's out there. And you'll see here that it's not, and we're doing a pretty good job, can always do better, but we're doing a pretty good job with our, our students that are, are divers in our program. And we're learning all the time of how not only that we become better within the interscholastic range, but if they're diving outside of the school, how we're working together. But, so we'll, you'll see a little bit of that. Um, about 50% of all the injuries are overuse type injuries. And they involve the shoulder. Not too surprising, but 50% of overuse. Now, what we would say is, when you look at that as a coach is, is it conditioning? Is it what you're having the athletes do? Um, how can you reduce that? As a coach, if you said 50%, now we, not a large number of injuries, but if you say 50% are overuse, then that would tell you maybe focus on what you can do to, to reduce that. Um, in boys, uh, you'll see that diving accounted for roughly 9%. Uh, and in girls, diving accounted for just a little over 4%. You can kind of go through there. So you can see that those are not, um, those are not percentages that jump out that there's something drastically wrong with that particular event. The issue is maybe those injuries, though, are the type of injuries that keep the athlete out longer. Uh, and so one, from safety you're concerned, two, if you're a high school student, who wants to sit out meets? Yes, sir. That one?
It could be dry lands. It could be we were horsing around and I fell in the locker room. It could be I slipped and fell on the deck. In other words, it's not a direct swimming-related injury. Okay? Uh, Yeah, we're going to get to that. Okay. Uh, whoops. Okay. Um, here we had just with girls that um, they had the second lowest injury rate uh, after after boys, and you can see that our numbers kind of go up with the girls uh, with their overall injury rate. So we we do see a few more injuries within our girls swimming program than we do with our boys' swimming program. Uh, part of that, we think, is, is that girls are probably a little more honest with the injury, okay? That young men might not always report the injury to you. So we kind of have accounted uh, that that may be one of the reasons, but again, you'll see with your females, you have a few more injuries. Um, here you can see, uh, again, is the, you know, the overall, and here's the one that you want to be concerned with. The overall injury rate is 0.19 per 1,000 exposures. That sounds pretty good. All right. So, again, you can see uh, how safe swimming and diving is when you look at for every, every 1,000 that you go to, here's what, here's what you see. Uh, with concussions... Uh, concussions account for about 9% of the injuries. Now, that's in all sports, okay, all sports. And um, our figures would show that we have about 140,000 concussions in high school athletes on a yearly basis, okay? So the concussion issue is serious, but you can see in swimming and diving, our numbers are quite a bit lower than that. Uh, here's just a graph uh, that will give you um, how concussions break out by, by sport. And um, not a surprise, football uh, kind of leads the pack. That's not really a, what I would say, not the leader of the pack statistic that they want, but they are there. But then as you kind of go down through there, uh, you'll see that our, our boys swimming and diving and our girls swimming and diving uh, go down. Uh, Boys volleyball is very low, but again, that's a, that's a very low number of participants to, uh, you know, to begin with. So you can kind of get an idea, and this is for, you can see, this is a, a trend over time of how many we see. So we're, we're doing well in this sport. Yes, sir? I can't quite tell. Is cheerleading up there? Uh, like yes, okay, it you. is. It's just not quite halfway up. Okay. Cheerleading, cheerleading is up there. And... Uh, um, that's a good question with Shirley. Uh, but, there, but again, you can kind of see what, what our, our numbers are. Now, the nature of the sport helps, but if you think about some of the things that you all have done and within, within the rules what have been done over the, the past, I'm going to say, at least decade, maybe a little bit more, of trying to work with issues that make it safe. Think back of how you used to have your kids warm up. I can remember when I first started uh, at the Missouri uh, High School Association, and we got, you know, we were working with our state meet. This was back in 1982, and oh my gosh, it was just like a frothing pool. Uh, there were so many bodies, and they were everywhere, and then gradually we began to refine how you would warm up, uh, you know, and, and, and work with that. So there are so many things that you do that each little piece kind of fits in to just make it better. We'll tell you that we have, lot, we have a number of injuries that occur during warm-ups or during practice. More kids in the pool, they're going different directions. I mean, it's, you know, it's not nearly as controlled. So that's the part as a, as a high school coach, you want to make sure that you have a, a good, what I would say, kind of a good protocol, a good practice session, whether it's just in your own practice in your pool or whether it's the warm-up before meet and that you have uh, proper supervision. Whoops. Uops. Uh, here again is just to give you by concussions by um, the sport by girls and by boys, and you can see, uh, and we also break it out by competition and, and by practice. Um, when you see that the numbers go up uh, a little bit here toward the end, that is, we believe, primarily, uh, part, part of that is primarily due to 
we are much more aware of concussions and we report now. We are, we are smarter. We see, we observe, the kids are reporting. So we think that our level of awareness is higher now uh, than what we have had before. So we're not quite sure that as we look at this and we think we need a few more years to kind of see how those numbers begin to, to play out, we think that we'll see a plateau or maybe even a, a decrease perhaps, but at least a plateau, which will then give us the indication that some of this was because it, we're, we're reporting more frequently and we're doing a better job of uh, noticing what's going on with the athletes. Uh, here we look at kind of the mechanism of what was the athlete doing uh, when they suffered the concussion, whether it was contact with another person, whether it was contact, we say the playing surface, that, so that would be the pool or the deck or the board uh, or, or, and then the playing apparatus which would come down. So you can kind of see, we want to find out. Now your committee just requested Right now, we've put board and starting platforms together, uh, and they've asked that in the survey that we split those out uh, even a little bit further. So we'll see, are we getting a problem because of the starting platform, and are we getting a problem because of, of the diving board? So that, uh, we think, will help as well. You can see that there, coming off the, the diving board, uh, whether they're swimming, it's the touch turn off the wall, it's the flip turn off the wall, and then other, and that would get back kind of to the I fell on the deck type situation. Um, we also break down, we want to know whether the injuries are occurring in competition or in practice, and that's important because competition might end up being rule related, practice may be what you do, okay? So we try to break that down is, is there something that is occurring uh, in the sport either with a rule change that we have made or is there something that we look at that we think we need to change a rule and maybe reduce the injuries because of something that we have have done. Um, I'm looking around the room and I'm going to just make a guess that there are several of you around where we looked at the minimum water depth under starting platforms. Okay, um, We saw injuries uh, we had anecdotal reports of injuries, we had lawsuits regarding injuries, and it wasn't just federation, it was the swimming community in general, it was we need to look at this minimum water depth under our starting platforms and eventually a change is made. Uh, I want to kind of interject right here in that the federation, e even though we're a separate organization from the NCAA or from USA Swimming, there is a dialogue that takes place between our three organizations when we look at rule changes that are, are about to take place, especially when it deals with uh, equipment, if it deals with pool construction, when it deals with water depth, and yes, when we deal with changes in strokes. So we, we, do, we do have that, you know, that dialogue. Uh, we may not all end up with the same rule, but we, again, we try to look at what rule is the appropriate rule for high school swimming programs. It just kind of has to, you know, has to work that way. Uh, so we do make those changes. Uh, as uh, we look at concussion management, um, we use the term, and you may have heard this, you know, when in doubt, set them out. Uh, all this, always kind of a, you can help you remember. But if you're not sure whether an athlete is having a problem, your best call is hold them out. Don't, don't put them back, don't put them back in. Uh, your return to play policies, uh, that may deal with your state association and it also may deal with your school, okay? As a coach, for liability purposes, don't skimp on the return to play. Know what your policy is, follow the policy. And I know as coaches, you're looking at your athlete, you know them, they want to be in, you want them to be in, um, you don't want them to miss more meets because you know that you know there's a there's a limited window for them just just to participate. But you want to make sure that whatever your return to play policy is, you're staying with that policy. Uh, too too much at stake both for the athlete and for you as as well. So what what can you do as a coach? Um, be educated. Uh, have your emergency action plan, which is probably going to be developed by a school. Uh, 
Uh, how many of you are in schools where your athletic administrator is very knowledgeable about the sport of swimming and diving? Okay, we have a few. How many of you are in a school that, you know, they're pretty good? Okay, that number went even down. How many of you are in a school that you are the expert in your school and you have to really kind of spoon feed them about the sport of swimming and diving? Okay, all right, so, and, and that's important to know because as you work with your emergency action plan, I will tell you that within, and you know this, that within the confines that you have a variable that nobody else has, water, water. I can get hit on the head and I fall on the track. I can get hit on the head and I fall on the football field. I can get hit on the head and I fall in the pool. And now the water becomes an additional factor for you. So that's why you'll see uh, sometimes maybe you, you have to work about the need for lifeguards. When should we have lifeguards and those types of things. So re just remember that in your sport, you have one more variable that you have to contend with, and that is water. Your athletic director may not think about that. They may think about one policy fits all, but that one policy doesn't include some of the things that, that you work with, uh, you know, in, in uh, swimming and diving. So just make sure that you go ahead and share your expertise in, in that aspect as well with your athletic administrator because he or she, quite honestly, might not be thinking about the water as the variable that, that you have that they don't. Um, you need to understand we talked about the role of the official and the, the medical professionals. We talked about that and then whatever your district and state association policies are. Uh, let me give you just some uh, resources now. We have uh, uh, an online course that is free. Many states will tell you as a coach that you get the opportunity to take that course. Um, if, you, if your school district doesn't mandate that course, it's a great course to go through. Uh, again, it's free and you can kind of see the numbers. It was developed with uh, CDC, so it's probably one of the best courses that's out there on the market. And again, it's online, so it's at your convenience 24-7. Uh, um, this is just kind of the, the page advertising that it's free. We'll kind of go through there. Uh, here's just some inside looks of what that course will, you know, will look like if you haven't had to take it. How many of you in here have taken that course? Okay, so a good, a good number of you. Um, and then with that, we always list resources. So on, on that course at the end, it has a go to the locker room or whatever. I think that's what they call it. And you have other resources that you can go to uh, to look up about, uh, you know, about concussions. And um, you may want, you know, you may want to do that because we're, we actually add to that. Uh, that's the nice thing about these online courses. We can take down old information. We can put up new information uh, on, on the resources. And we try to do that to keep up with whatever the research is uh, telling us. Uh, and again, kind of the common causes. And then we have a first aid course. Uh, many of your school districts will tell coaches that they have to take a first aid course. There are a number of ways that you can do that. Some states even have a requirement that you, you have to have uh, first aid. Uh, again, you're going you're gonna to have first aid and other issues because of the water issue that you will, you know, will deal with. Um, equipment, that's not really so much for you all, uh, but we do have within all the rule books, we have various position statements that the Federation develops. And again, when we develop these position statements, they're developed with the best in the field across the United States to end up with a position statement. So if your school district is looking to come up with something, you know, they might, you might go actually to, to a rule book because you don't necessarily have to re, uh, you know, reinvent the, the wheel. Um, I'm going to go back because you may, you may see this from time to time. I'll just say this in general. Because concussion is the hot topic right now, manufacturers, vendors, they're coming up with everything under the sun to tell you, well, if you use this, we're going to reduce the risk of concussion. All right? Um, it doesn't happen. There isn't really anything out there on the market that anyone is aware of that really reduces the risk of suffering a concussion. Okay? So um, I'm not sure what someone would have in swimming. Anybody have anything in swimming that 
you've seen that they said it would reduce the, the issue of concussion. I don't know of anything, maybe a special cap for a diver, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but um, it, they're, they're, they're kind of non-existent because it's not just the hit, it's the juggling of the, the brain that is also what we now know is the, the part of the concussion to work with. Uh, we do have in all of our rule books the, uh, the uh, con uh, management of concussion. What I would say is this is the quick look. This is the quick look that you can go to of what are the signs and symptoms uh, of a concussion. So if you kind of forget that from time to time, it's in your rule book and, and it's a quick guide for you. Uh, these are just our, our suggestions on the return to play. Uh, they should not return to play the day uh, of a concussion or suspected concussion unless they really are cleared. Most physicians, healthcare professionals, if, it, they, if they believe that it might be a concussion, they're not going to probably put them back in that day. Okay? They, because you usually have to have a 24-hour window to see what's happening with the student okay, because of the injury. So uh, that is one. Um, <clears throat> make sure that they're evaluated on that same day. You don't want to send them home. Okay, sometimes you get it and they'll say, I feel okay. Well, tell me tomorrow if it's still bothering you. Don't, don't do that. If, you, if it's a suspected concussion, you want to make sure that they are being seen by a healthcare professional that day because that first 24-hour period is, is critical. Um, and then we talked about being cleared by the professional and then your re return to play. We have a sports medicine handbook. Um, not, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but... Bob wants me to ask this. How many of you have ever been exposed to the sports medicine handbook that the Federation puts out? Okay. Um, this is, we're getting ready to do a new edition on this. Uh, it has a lot of good information in here that you would use as a coach. It is online. Okay. So I would encourage you to take advantage of looking at that because you can take the things that, that fit your sport and put it into, uh, you know, into to your, your policies. Um, there's a chapter in there that deals with concussions, all right? Uh, this, is a good, this is a good resource for parents. You want them to know. Um, and then we also have uh, guidelines for management. We have a parent's guide for concussions. And then in our High School Today magazine, which is also online, it's delivered to schools, but it's online, we'll run articles in there periodically that try to update on what is going on in the, in the world and of concussions and research and what we find and make that, um, you know, available. Where we see kind of the future this is going, we're still trying to, you know, keep track of state and federal legislation. And um, you all know... And I, and I know, you all know that every once in a while there will be something that happens to someone in, at the federal level. It's their son, their daughter, their granddaughter, uh, Virginia Graham Baker. You all familiar with that one? Okay, and the, the filter, the cover on the filter? Okay, right? That was the granddaughter of Senator Baker that drowned, I believe, was the, was the kind of the catalyst for for that piece of federal legislation. Uh, and uh, so you just never know where it's going to come and what people ask. I know that we tried to keep um, states uh, apprised when that legislation passed. If I remember correctly, it, it went into effect that by December 1 of whatever, uh, 2004, 2005, had to have the drain covers. They didn't even make the drain covers yet, but yet the law was if you didn't have the drain cover, your pool would be shut down. Uh, so sometimes those things come, come about, and so we try to keep track of that and disseminate that information. We can't get it to every school, but we try to disseminate that to state associations, and I know that you all get information, so it's good to share and, and keep that uh, you know, on, the, on the forefront. We talked a little bit about playing rules. Um, your rules committee... Um, made a recommendation for a rule change uh, that our board is considering right, right now. I will tell you that before they did anything, 
they spent Diane on, I don't know how much time, talking about starting platforms and safety. Before they ever got to anything else, it was the safety and the risk of injury. So the committee really takes a good look at, that's where they start, especially with equipment. Or if we're looking at changes in strokes, does that do anything that might have a safety implication uh, in, in what we do? Uh, of course, then we have the injury uh, surveillance system that we, we watch, and then um, we look for academic uh, accommodations after there's been a concussion. Anybody had an athlete that's, that's had a concussion and had issues after the concussion? Chronic headaches or anything like that? Okay, so you, you know that when they go back into the classroom, they can really have some issues. And so we're trying to, in the future, of what, what would we do? How would we try to accommodate? Um, any questions from anybody? We've got just a couple of minutes. Yes, Paul. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, we, we would like to have more schools report on the injury surveillance system, and if you go on our website, it has the, the uh, uh, address, the web address, uh, email address of where you can go. If you have a certified athletic trainer, that's, that's the first requirement, certified athletic trainer, and if they would agree to report the injuries, there is a small stipend that goes to that, that athletic trainer for taking his or her time to participate in the survey. They don't necessarily have to participate in all sports. They can, they can say we're only going to report for swimming and diving. So we, are, we would like to increase the number of schools that we have uh, reporting. So if, if you have a trainer in your school, whether you know, that, that you have, um, and they would be willing to do that, at, at least for this sport, uh, we would love to have them. If, you, if it's easier and you don't want to go online and, and look that up, if you just want to email me, uh, you know, there at the Federation, you can do that and we'll, we'll get you the right, you know, the right information uh, to, to connect. Any other questions? Yes? Um, I've heard the Ivy League has stronger concussion football guidelines than what most other football programs have adopted. Uh, are you familiar with those and is there a chance that other schools pick up those Ivy League guidelines? Uh, I am only, what I would say, aware that they have done that. I don't know what they are. Um, could not tell you whether somebody's going to do more. I will tell you that the um, lawsuits with the NFL are stimulating quite a bit of interest in that sport of what to do. And that is why I think we, we want to focus on good, a good um, strong injury surveillance because we're coming back to counter what I would say is just like diving is so dangerous we should eliminate it from the swimming and high school swimming and diving program. In other words, we want to keep facts out there. I really couldn't tell you whether more will go with, you know, with more stringent uh, issues in football or not. That, that's, I, that's not a sport that I work with, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not really qualified probably to comment too much more than that. Yes? Certain injury surveys that you showed. Mm-hmm. Okay, his question was on the, on the overuse injuries, the shoulder injuries. Does that include athletes that come into the program with that injury? We don't really have a way of knowing uh, whether we do or we don't. And that is um, an issue probably in almost every sport that we, that we work with is when the kids are, you know, doing other, other activities or the same sport, you know, in a different venue. Uh, the best I can tell you is that just strongly encourage, and I know this is, you know, sometimes a little bit of a rose color picture a little bit, but making sure that if you have athletes that are, you know, in an outside swimming program, that if they have an injury, somehow that's getting communicated, whether it's by way of the, the student and his or her parents or that other coach that you, you know what you have to work with. Uh, that, that's important. I would make this suggestion to you. 
Um, include your parents in what you do, all right? And, and I know you all do. And um, I know that sometimes, um, you know, I've been a parent of an athlete. Uh, we, we are a little focused on that one athlete that's the gift from heaven in that sport. Uh, but you want to make sure that what you're doing and the purpose of what you're doing, that you include, you include the parents. Because that's why you'll see the role of a parent, you know, in the concussion. They do have a role in letting you know if there is something that's already happened someplace other than in, in your program. Because if not, you're going to train as though there was not an injury. And you may aggravate that injury. But try and um, get your parents to, to buy in that they, they are a partner with what you do. Uh, but there is that line, you are the coach, they are the parent. They are not the assistant coach. They are, you know, they are a parent, the, the, what they do. And I know that that sometimes is a, a little, you juggle a lot of balls to get that all to happen. But when it deals with the safety of the student, um, it is important that they're, they're buying in and they're helping because they, they are the ones that look at them after they leave your, you know, your school. They're the ones that can tell you whether they're doing the rehabilitation that they should do or taking care of themselves, those type of things. So um, it, it is a partnership in that, in that regard. I think we had another, yeah, Arlo. We don't do water polo. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> we, we don't do water polo, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, reason being is the number of states that have water polo is a, it has, it's at a lower number. We have nine, nine states that, that officially sanction water polo. So it's kind of a lower on, the, lower on the list. Although I would have to think that any sport that started out with a term brutality probably has injuries. <laughs> Just joking. We don't use that term anymore, by the way. We got that changed for everybody. Any other questions from anybody? No, I, want to, I want to go back to what you just is, is water polo recognized by the National Federation? It is. It is. And I'm the rules editor for water polo. Don't collect any data? We, we, don't collect, uh, we don't collect data on water polo. We have to have, in order for the sampling, you have to have a certain number of states to participate in a certain number of, of students. And at this point, when we started, uh, we don't collect water polo. Doesn't mean that, we're, that we won't eventually. It's kind of, you know, putting it in uh, and, and getting, the, getting the funding. And most of the funding comes through our foundation and through um, some, some grants with um, Ohio State and, and the hospitals to, uh, you know, to do this. Yes? Um, I'm from Colorado. Our state association is primarily funded from the gay. Yes. Okay, how are we funded? That's a good question. Uh, about 48% of our funding comes from the sale of rule books. <clears throat> so that's why you'll notice that we don't put our rule books up online because that's kind of our tickets, if you will. Uh, and then our others comes from uh, the coach's education. It comes from corporate partnerships and advertising. Um, uh, membership in a coaches and officials association. So pri primarily, we used to be at one point in time. I think we were up like 75 to 80 percent was on rule books, and we've been working to, you know, bring that level down because we know that w we need to keep moving on into the digital electronic era with with some of that. So the rule books are the you know are the primary uh, uh, source of our of our income. We do have a foundation. Uh, and that foundation is, ha, was founded to uh, make contributions basically to research and issues dealing with um, safety uh, issues and uh, student leadership, sportsmanship, and education. So this injury surveillance system, uh, a good portion of that program is funded through our, you know, through our foundation. And that's kind of separate from our budget. Yes, sir. State associations do pay a membership fee. Um, I think it's 5000 I believe, total. And um, part of that, uh, they have agreed that they want to put part of that into the, the foundation. So uh, each state does that, and that's for all the services that they, they receive, um, you know, from the, from the federation. 
Okay? I think we're close to time, I believe, Paul. Is that correct? Uh, and I, I would, um, I, again, thank you very much. Sorry we kind of switched the, the uh, order. But uh, hope to see you and more uh, this afternoon. Uh, I know I might be competing with swimming, uh, but I'm not. Okay, well, we hope you come back because I think you'll find it interesting. Thank you.